Welcome to Funny Cause It's True, true stories told by funny people. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show, and this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is teenagers, stories of cruelty, acceptance, and dorkiness. Josh Callahan talks about when he was the butt of a joke. Josh Willis cops to the fact that a teenage boy who drives a pink Mary Kay car might not be the luckiest with girls, and I discuss what it's like to look like Chuck Norris. But let's not dawdle. First up, Josh Callahan. I have a day job. I have several. This is one of them, but I'm also a substitute school teacher. Don't. Don't. Uh, it's terrible. It is, uh, it is an awful job, but when you have a, a, a bachelor's degree in theater, there are precious few <laughs> jobs that you can get uh, that require A, a bachelor's degree, and B, a bachelor's degree in something so useless. Uh, so uh, I, I'm a, a grade school, or a, a, a school substitute teacher in middle school, primarily, and it is a terrible age. It is a terrible age. I'm a 27-year-old man, and those kids scare the shit out of me. They are the meanest kids, and they will immediately hone in on any insecurities you, as a grown person, still have and exploit them to make you feel bad uh, in front of their peers. And it works. It works, you guys. Uh, I have uh, naturally hard nipples. (laughs) Much of the time, regardless of temperature. And that is a thing that you notice. And when you are 25 and considering a nipple tape purchase on Amazon.com, just so kids won't laugh at you at school, that is a thing. Uh, so I, um, it's a job where you, you really have to have fun. And I knew that things had really taken a wrong turn when uh, I was too embarrassed for the kids whose names I would have to call uh, during attendance. So they give you attendance sheets when you get to school. And it's extremely important that it is accurate because schools are paid by the student. Um, when students don't show up to school, they're actually losing money, X amount of dollars for every student attending school that day. So it is of the utmost importance that the attendance is correct. So, uh, you know, they make it very clear, hey, you are to get this roster, you are to call out every single name. Uh, I worked in the Glendale Unified School District, and for those of you who are from out of town or have never been to Glendale, uh, it is a very diverse (laughs) ethnic neighborhood. Uh, There's a very large Armenian population, and uh, a lot of people don't know, but there's a very large Korean population. So eventually, uh, I wrapped my head around the Armenian names. Uh, you know, they're not particularly difficult once you get them. But there's one name that always gave me a lot of trouble. Uh, it's a Korean name, and it's spelled D-O-N-G. Yeah. So, uh, which, when I read it, and the first time I ever called it out, I called the kid Dong. And he, he's probably dead, because he probably hung himself, because his friends would not stop making fun of him <laughs> the entire day. I'm sure he's fine. Uh, I'm sure he's fine. So it's actually pronounced Dong, I learned months later. Uh, In the interim, however, my uh, roll call would go something to the effect of John, Gavork, Stacy, and Dong would raise his or her hand and say, you didn't call my name. And I would say, oh, knowing exactly who it was, "Uh, what's what's your name? Dong? Oh, yeah. No, here you are. I got you. You probably just didn't hear me. Uh, On one of those days, I had a student um, who uh, thought it would be hilarious. (sighs) Students are very mean. Like I said, sorry, as I remember this happening, it was a terrible experience. I I came into class. And, uh, you know, we started the lesson plans in so much as you have a lesson plan when you're a substitute teacher. And uh, I had a student who was not saying anything to me whatsoever, Uh, just stone silent, looking straight ahead. And as a performer and someone who, you know, likes to sound her own voice, there's nothing I hate more when I'm not getting someone's full attention. So I'm, you know, I'm up in front of class doing bits, which, you know, aren't working. But uh, and I say, hey, what's your deal? Am I, not, am I not amusing you? Is this not engaging material? This is history. Come on, this isn't bad. This could be a lot worse, kiddo. And the girl sitting next to him falls silent, and the rest of the class falls silent. And she says, Mr. Callahan, he's, he's mute. He can't speak. And I said, shit, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Nope. You can't talk. 
And uh, I spent the entirety of a 57-minute class running through my head the excuses I would make to the administrator that would come in and say, why in the fuck did you try to get that mute kid to speak in front of their entire class full of peers? Uh, I never came up with anything good. And uh, when minute 56 of a 57-minute period rolled around, that same girl raised her hand, and I said, yeah, what, what is it? She said, um, he's not really mute. <laughs> he can talk, it's fine. And I said, shut up, and he said, yeah, I can talk, and the bell rang, and then I spent most of my lunch period crying. <laughs> Next up, Josh Willis. Cars do not make the man. This is what I learned in high school. Uh, in fact, even if that car is a faded pink monstrosity that will only ever fire on 4.2 of six alleged cylinders, <laughs> even then, hot blonde chicks will still try to drag you into the back seat as long as you have the right mullet. <laughs> now, okay, well, maybe it wasn't the mullet. And actually, maybe we never quite made it to the back seat, but here is what happened. Her name was Chastity Barnes. Now, Chastity was a beautiful, buxom blonde from the wrong side of Interstate 35, a hot blonde bad girl. Me, I was just the nerdy kid with the bad mullet. But we grew up in uh, the Bible Belt, just outside of Dallas, Texas. It was the kind of place where men were men and real men wore cowboy boots and drove pickup trucks and named their daughters things like Chastity. <laughs> The year was 1990, and one rainy Friday afternoon, I brought Chastity over to my house, and we hung out for a few hours, and then about 8 p.m., my dad told me that I had to take Chastity home because I had to wake up early the next day and take the SAT. So now, my dad is a Texas boy, a real Texas boy. He's got a, a red push broom mustache, and he talks really slow with a thick southern twang, sort of a combination of uh, Magnum P.I. and Jeff Foxworthy. Basically, my dad tells us, he says, you, you, you know, y'all, y'all better not screw around now, he says. Um, you better get back here in 30 minutes. Well, Chastity only lived about five minutes away, so after a quick calculation, I realized that we had time to make a little detour. So uh, we jumped into my mom's 1984 faded pink Buick Regal. Now, for a teenager, this car was like a curse from God. Not only was it pink, it had a white vinyl top, it had maroon velour seats, it had opera windows, it had a Mary Kay sticker on the back, even though no one in my family actually worked for Mary Kay. <laughs> we called it the Pink Beast. And by some miracle, this car had actually been stolen while Chastity and I were out on a date watching the movie Flatliners, a, uh, a Kiefer Sutherland, Kevin Bacon classic. Um, so, uh, but the, the celebration was really short-lived, though, because we got the car back in just two days. Even criminals didn't want it. Now. Um, we set off on the road, and uh, my neighborhood at the time was really out in the middle of nowhere. It, it, uh, there must have been a hundred places on the side of the road where you could uh, pull over in a secluded spot and have a deep philosophical conversation, but none of those were really good enough for me. I decided to drive all the way to the end of our subdivision, where there was this beautiful little creek lined with trees, and a tiny bridge that broke through the trees and emptied onto a massive empty field. And I pulled the pink beast up onto the bridge, and, and Chastity and I looked over, and she said, hmm, you know, it looks kind of muddy over there. I said, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. And as soon as I left the bridge and we entered the grass, the car sank about six inches. <laughs> um, Chastity said, "Woo!" said the pink Buick. Now, it wasn't the spinning tires that worried me so much as when I turned the wheel 90 degrees and the car continued on in a perfectly straight line and then sank just a little deeper, at which point uh, Chastity uh, turned to me and, and twirled her straight blonde hair in her fingers and said, you are so dead. <laughs> so about 45 minutes later, uh, we're walking home in the rain, covered in mud, we're carrying our shoes in our hand and huddled together under my acid-washed blue jean jacket. <laughs> when we finally got home, my dad, of course, was furious, which I could tell because his mustache kept twitching. And um, he, uh, I said, you know, look, I really wanted to get home in 30 minutes, but uh, I took a wrong turn, and somehow the Buick wound up stuck in a big, big empty field uh, with mud up to the doors. 
So he gritted his teeth and he told me, um, get in our other car, which was a uh, 1977 metallic blue Chevy Malibu, yet another American classic, uh, and take Chastity home and get back here as fast as you can. We would free the pink beast from the mud tomorrow after I took the SAT. So I barreled down the road in my uh, Chevy Malibu and, and I got to Chastity's uh, house and dropped her off. And I remember, I remember watching her as I backed out and uh, I sort of waved goodbye and, and she waved goodbye and then I sort of blew her a little kiss and she blew me a little kiss and then I backed straight across the street and into a ditch. <laughs> Whoop! Now, then there was that sound, that all too familiar sound of, uh, of spinning tires on wet grass and that strange feeling of looking out the window and seeing that the ground was just a little bit too close to your face, you know. And uh, I got out of the car, and by that time, Chastity's younger brother, Hank, had wandered out onto the driveway to laugh at me. And uh, eventually, um, the three of us used their dad's pickup truck to pull my Chevy Malibu out of the ditch and, and back up onto the street. And no sooner had we got it up on all fours did the Chevy Malibu cough and then sputter and then ran out of gas. Hank was laughing so hard he could barely suck enough gasoline out of his dad's gas tank to get me home. Well, it was about midnight when I finally pulled back into my own driveway, and by this point, my dad was uh, climbing into his pickup truck to come figure out where in the Sam hell I'd been. So I sat down with both him and my mom, and I told them the whole story from start to finish. And, uh, you know, like a lot of women from the South, my mom has that special gift where she can look deep within your soul and with this perfect smile on her face, ask you the most embarrassing question you can possibly imagine. So she leaned forward, and with this little twinkle in her eye, she said, well, did you get to make out at least? Next up, me, Kevin McGeehan. When I turned 30, something happened. A very peculiar thing started happening to me on a semi-regular basis. People, sometimes complete strangers, feel so very inclined to come up to me and tell me how much I resemble Chuck Norris. Uh, I will admit, when, I first, when it first started happening, I was not the biggest fan of it. Uh, I, I, it was kind of weird to me, and I wasn't sure if people were making fun of me. And uh, let's, uh, let's not split hairs there. I mean, Chuck Norris is a very handsome man, and he's very, very accomplished. I mean, he is a renowned karate champion. He is an international movie star. He is the spokesman for the Total Gym, and he is TV's titular Texas Ranger. And like I said, I wasn't sure if people were making fun of me, but for instance, one day I called the Salvation Army to come down to my house and pick up some stuff out of my garage. Upon arriving, the guy who was in charge with the clipboard got out of the truck, looked at me, acknowledged me, and then without missing a beat, he launched into this speech. There must be some sort of problem here because I look here on my clipboard and it says that I'm picking up furniture from Kevin McGeehan, but obviously that's wrong because I'm looking at Chuck Norris. <laughs> Not sure where he was coming from, I sighed and responded with, no, the clipboard's right. Uh, but, then, but then I began to embrace it, and I started to actually enjoy the comparison and have fun with it. One time I was in a grocery store, and the clerk looked at me and then lowered his head and chuckled to himself and said, Chuck Norris. <laughs> to which I said, he's my uncle. And he looked at me so very excited and said, oh my God, what's he like? And because I had already started the lie and I didn't want to get too far into it, I said, he's exactly as you think he would be. <laughs> In 2004, Conan O'Brien started doing this thing that introduced him to a brand new generation. He started doing the Walker, Texas Ranger lever, where he would pull a lever, and then we would see an out-of-context clip of a Walker, Texas Ranger episode up on the screen. For instance, the very famous one of Haley Joel Osment saying very matter-of-factly, Walker told me I have AIDS. So like I said, this introduced him to a whole new generation. So that summer, I walked into an improv summer camp that I was teaching for kids, and I walked into a room full of 13 to 15-year-olds, a group that I will admit intimidates the hell out of me. And all of them found it so incredibly funny that I look like Chuck Norris. 
like I said, I just accepted it and moved on. So from the entire time that I taught them, I used metaphors for karate and justice to teach them the rules of improvisation. It was such a big hit with them that eventually they named their group for their final show, Looks Like Chuck. Um, I also started playing him on stage. And uh, it became a very fun thing to do in sketch shows. And I'm not going to lie, it was simply for the easy laugh. Because all I had to do was walk on stage with a cowboy hat on my head and say, Hi, I'm Chuck Norris. And the place would go absolutely crazy. So much so that my girlfriend at the time was sitting in the audience and she told me that the guy in front of her leaned over to his wife and said very matter-of-factly, Well, the guy certainly knows who he looks like. (laughs) Now... Like I said, so this went on for a long time, so much so that I wanted to tell my mother about it. And I thought it would be a, a fun thing to share with her. She and I used to take walks together where I would talk on the phone and just walk her around whatever city I was in. And one day I was telling her about this whole thing, this weird phenomenon that people recognize me as Chuck Norris. I mean, the man is 30 years my senior, but they just, for some reason, feel I'm some sort of relation or whatever. My mother, being a mother who likes to take the wind out of my sails occasionally, said, well... I believe that you believe you get recognized often. (laughs) Very frustrated, I continued talking to her, trying to convince her, until eventually a bus arrives. And the bus, the doors open, and I walk up the steps, and loud enough for her to hear on the other end of the phone, the bus driver said, hey, you look like Chuck Norris. (laughs) She started laughing at the other end of the phone, and I went right to her, yes, I do believe I get recognized often. It was an amazing, vindicating moment between myself and my mother. But that is not my favorite moment of that I was recognized as Chuck Norris. My favorite moment was in the most unlikely of places by the most unlikely of people. And I think my resemblance actually might have saved me from a pretty disastrous fate. And if you are curious as to what that one is... I'll tell you in part two. That's it. That's our show. Thanks to our storytellers, Josh Callahan and Josh Willis. Special thanks to Mark Warzeka, the Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Cause It's True is normally every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood located on beautiful and mildly scary Hollywood Boulevard. Go to Facebook.com and like funny because it's true that's funny c-u-z it's true to find out upcoming show dates and upcoming themes the live show is taking a small break due to theater renovations and so there will be no show on february 28th but wipe those tears away because it will return on tuesday march 13th and the theme will be backfire so come out sign up right before the show and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage and from there get chosen to be on the podcast my name is kevin mcgann thanks for listening For more funny stuff for your eyes and ears, go to ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.